timestamp. So if you do have to leave for something, you can still come back and know what time you should come back. But please, like, look at those times, you know, somewhat flexibly, maybe come five minutes early compared to those times, just to be sure. Um, so first, we're going to have a lengthy intro on what execution on the 2.0 is. Um, and then we, we have some explanation on a toolkit we have, which is called Scout. Um, you should be really stay for these first two talks, just for sure, because that gives you the background of what this is. And Scout explains to you how you can write any of these environments, how you can test those out. Um, so if you guys are developing or want to develop anything on E2.0, these are the, the bare minimum you should really have a look at. And then we're going to go very deep into a lot of the research we have done on execution environments. Um, a big challenge with execution environments is, which Casey is going to explain, is that they are stateless. And therefore we need to transmit all the data uh, to the execution environments we need to perform any kind of operation. And the big challenge there is how to efficiently encode that data. And we have a couple of different ways to do that. Uh, so for example, the, the turbo proof is one way, SSZ is another, SSZ is another way, and jungle token is, is a third way. So these three talks are going to explain these different ways and compare them against each other. Um, we're going to, at the end, conclude with a testnet demo, which I hope will be very interesting. Um, so Casey, if you want to start up, it's your your time to do the first talk. Please welcome everyone, Casey. Oh, get the slides, please. While we get the slides, uh, we won't have like a specific Q and A slot. Rather, we're gonna have some Q and A time after each talk. So please, you know, ask your questions. Then. Uh, so when Serenity, I mean, if the uncertainty around the timeline and the architecture of E2 is driving you a little bit crazy, uh, try being a poor dev. Uh, I like the, um, something, uh, Joe DeLong said, he organized the recent interop and, uh, the other day on the, on the session, he said, basically we should come to the interop view join the cult. Well, <laughs> if we have a cult, maybe this should be the prayer. Um, and we're praying every day that out of this chaos, you know, will spring, will spring forth some sanity and uh, some serenity. So when is serenity, I mean, coming soon, right? The sharding is coming. Um, soon, since 2015, it's been coming. Um, no, I mean, there's a detailed blog post since 2015 about Casper and Serenity and how it would work. Uh, and you actually have to go back this far to understand, you know, where the architecture of uh, these two comes from. And I think the main point is there were two betting cycles. Uh, black cash betting and state group betting. This is when we had consensus by bet was what it was called. That was game theory, then turned out well. Traditional computer science uh, is more secure and has worked this out better. So maybe just do something PBFT inspired and that became Casper FFG. Uh, but the main point is that these two game, these two processes are fundamentally <coughs> different types of games. Uh, one is a consensus game, the other one is an interactive verification game. They're fundamentally different because the consensus game is non-deterministic and the interactive ver verification game is deterministic. Um, this realization inspired the architecture, the phase one, phase two architecture. Uh, phase one is the consensus game and phase two is the verification game and ideally the two would be decoupled. Um, <laughs> as all this was happening, it, it, the way the, the roadmap evolved is, is kind of messy, but it was really this like, this June 
2018 pivot was really a hail, a hail mary. So again, we're just praying that this thing is gonna is gonna work out. Um, as of DevCon last year, this was the like launch plan. You're in phase one. We would launch phase one. There would be 1,000 shards. Every shard would collect lots of data blobs, and probably the data blobs would be filled with zero bytes. Um, so that's phase one. We collect data blobs. And phase two, we really didn't know. Um, early 2019, this question, the, all the like phase, the questions about phase two were still open. Um, how will state run work? Will there will execution be immediate or delayed? Will there be will all validators execute blocks, or will they just you know provide consensus on the data availability of the blocks? How will cross shard calls work? These we didn't have answers to these questions. Uh, if you hear the the phrase "phase one and done," what it refers to is an ETH research post. Um, it's not really a proposal at all. It was just like some ramblings that I wrote and posted. And it, you probably would never even, when I've heard about it, unless you are a religious follower of ETH research. Uh, but Vitalik responded to it 16 days later. So thanks Vitalik, I think that's why it started getting traction as a meme. Um, so, the philosophy and approach of phase one and done is basically we start, we just start answering some of these questions. So, how will state rent work? It won't because there won't be any state. It's going to be stateless. It's like way simpler. Every, you know, I think that's uh, commonly accepted now. It's going to be immediate execution, just like ETH1. That's simpler. Um, will all validators be, execu be executors? Yes. And uh, how will cross shard calls work? They're going to work great. Okay, don't worry. <laughs> uh, the philosophy is really uh, just like start simple, keep execution minimal. You know, don't try to answer every question. Just get something basic like working. You know, a basic prototype. So we piggyback on the existing data structures, the beacon state. Add a code field to the validator accounts. Okay, that's what EEs are. Um, and then you execute the code in the shard blocks. You return the state root. That keeps everything stateless. Uh, and so basically, in the post, I argue that when you have minimal execution, you know, coupled to these phase one uh, shard blocks, it's a 10x improvement over over if you just have you know, phase one as a data availability engine without execution. Um, so again, you start simple and easy. I like the term phase one and done because it's like the execution is coupled to consensus. So the old architecture with phase two and phase one decoupled, I mean, if, if execution is in phase one, then just, you know, just say that. Don't. Anyway, and you, you punt the hard questions, so we punt the hard questions um, about cross shard calls and you know so forth uh, out to the application layer because now if you're implementing this logic uh, in Wasm, you know it's not really in the core protocol, is it? I mean, it's like flexible. You, know, you can do it in EEs, whatever EEs can do, whatever you can implement, the like contracts on ETH1. So. So yeah, I mean, so you punt those hard questions where researchers can keep circling and whiteboarding and you know <laughs> in the meantime we can start actually building and prototyping with like you know we, we have something concrete to work with uh oh, recently i don't know this this word composability but composability uh it sounds like composability it's like charting is going to break composability this sounds like news from 2015. If you were paying attention, this this is a Vitalik's talk from 2015 at DevCon 1. I've just taken the text that was on his slide and put it up here so you can read it, okay? Ugly callback code per second. This is like referring to asynchronous shards. 
that's what people mean by breaking composability, right? That cross-shared calls are going to be asynchronous. Um, so he went, he walked through how this might work with an async call, an async log, an async callback, and but then, you know, in 2015, 2018, he has this other post about how you could do it synchronous cross shard calls. So, is E2 going to break composability? I mean, it sounds like it won't if we have synchronous <laughs> cross shared calls. Um, oh, by the way, if you heard there was going to be 1,000 shards, actually, it might be 64 shards instead. <laughs> um, so, uh, open questions. How will cross shard calls work? I don't know why people are afraid to say that. We don't know. Okay? <laughs> you know, you can ask for directions sometimes. We don't know. I mean, long answer. We had a prototype and figure it out. How will the ETH1 switchover work? So I just learned like a few hours ago, um, Vitalik posted a new post on ETH research. Uh, he doesn't call it the switchover. I was hoping the switchover would uh, gain traction since I proposed calling it the switchover. But he's calling it the transition. Uh, maybe we should call it the rapture. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, it may never happen. Okay. I mean, did, like months ago, it was really you know, there was skepticism that maybe the ETH one chain is going to have to continue on forever, and everyone will have to redeploy, rewrite all their DApps. We don't know um, how it's going to work. Let's try to prototype it and you know, see if we can make it work. Um, lastly, when's uh, January 3rd maybe, right? Um, also, like, we don't know what the price of ether is gonna be you know, next week. You'd be surprised how commonly people ask that. Um, and yeah, that's it for me. <laughs>
the only things we, we know right now is just how to execute stuff. But some other things are still decoupled from this system. The, the exact thing, I'm not sure if you want to go back to the slide, but the exact thing is who's going to keep the state and who's going to provide the state. Uh, and that big topic is, is called the relayer markets. That's one of the big topics we definitely need more eyes on. And another big topic then is called the fee markets. But what all of these means is how do we get the data, uh, the stateless contracts in, and how, how do we pay each of the parties involved? Um, and to, we, we have basically four parties here, at least. We have the users who want to do transactions and who want to use the system. Uh, we have another party, which we call relayers right now, who are basically the state <coughs> providers who store all of the state for you and are able to, to package up whatever transaction you send into something the system can actually use. Um, and then th these relayers send uh, these package things to the block proposers who are the ones actually running it on E2.0. Um, and each of these steps, people have to be paid. So they, these are kind of big questions and there are many ways to do it. And you're experimenting with different ways. Um, but before we get into cross shard communication, I would suggest maybe these are the things we have to solve first. Add a, add a little bit. Um, so we thought we knew that Wasm code would be run in the shard blocks and not in the beacon blocks. And then, you know, about a month ago, um, Vitalik made a new proposal. That, that was that was like the spec as a phase two proposal two. You just added. It was just added functionality. Yeah. Yeah, and then the added functionality was, oh, now we also run Wasm code in uh, beacon blocks, and so that was like the proposal three. And then the proposal to reduce the number of shards from 1,000 to 64, which uh, you already mentioned in the um, East Magician session, you know, a couple days ago, and said there will be, you know, more uh, published on this very soon. Uh, you know, that's like the radical new new proposal. Um, I don't know, I mean, that's kind of like what, what we know, is just as these proposals are, you know, rolling out, I mean, we know a little bit more every time there's a new one. What's the, what's the reason for the redaction? Yeah, so, I mean, it, each of them kind of can give their own strengths and weaknesses. So, like, the uh, proposal, what do we call it, two and a half, three? Three. Three um, provided um, some level of load balancing um, and some level of scheduling across the shards, and, and you kind of treat each of the shards as this pure computing layer. Um, one that kind of you know came after that um, was more has been more geared towards making crash shard calls um, significantly quicker. So you can make a crash shard call in one one block. Um, so if you're calling a contract on another block, on another shard, you can do that in, in one block. And so I think each proposal has its trade-offs. And so I think what, what you'll realize through kind of what we're talking about today, when, one of our goals um, has been to, you know, kind of test ground each of these um, and, and prototype each of these and, you know, really understand uh, the trade-offs, the gains um, on, on everything. Um, and yeah, as Alex said, the, I think the biggest, still to date, the biggest question um, is who, who's providing state? How, how are they paid to do that? And so um, we are, uh, we kind of needed to validate some other things first, like uh, that these stateless EEs could work in time. And that's generally been validated now. And so the, the next, you know, the next step is really beginning to validate that question. Um, regarding uh, the state and fee market. And then after that is, is really expanding a lot of the things around cross chart transactions. Um, but I, from an optimistic perspective, there, are, there is a lot of content and, and a lot of proposals and a lot of really promising directions for all of these. Um, so, uh, yeah. Thanks
Well, I think this is a good segue actually to, to the next talk. Um, just want to reiterate a tiny bit what you said. So there, what really kickstarted all this work was proposal two, which was an actual real thing written down so we could take a look at it and do something. But up to that point, everything happened just on each research and different discussions. Um, it's e easy to discuss stuff based on different texts, but it's also kind of hard to, to know which direction actually makes sense in practice. Um, so this was a big break with, with that kind of mindset. We started to take the proposal to as it is, blindly implemented it, and, and tried to validate certain aspects. And that implementation is, is what is carried. So basically we took uh, this proposal, implemented it, and we started out with just the goal of validating those basic assumptions. And the basic assumption we had is we have a limit of time you can spend in every, every shard block on processing. And we also have limits of how much data we can supply to these execution environments. Um, and basically we had to write some code uh, in WASM, which takes this data, tries to do transactions, and fit into the time limit. So this is what we have done. Um, and once we got like really good numbers and, and we solved all these different problems over a couple of months of time, then we started to look at the real air stuff. How do these things actually get the data? Uh, and the fee stuff. Uh, we had a long session discussing this on a whiteboard and kind of realized that it's insanely complex. Uh, and I think that's that's one of the reasons we cannot really just look in isolation with these things. We have to do we have to look at them in a more integrated way. And I think probably it was one of the reasons that these new proposals were inspired by. So I expect that they're going to be as we look at more of these different problems uh, and not just you know one problem at a time. They're going to be more and more proposals, and we're going to get closer to the solution. So Scout itself. So this thing is on. Okay. So as I said, it's this actual tangi tangible piece of code you can interact with. It's not just the text. Uh, so it implements the proposal too. We do plan to take in the, the changes from different proposals, and we also want to come up with our own proposals. But we haven't done that yet. We were really focusing on, on getting those core basic things answered regarding speed. Um, it actually black, does it have a pointer? doesn't work. Um, so it black boxes most of the, the stuff we don't care about. Uh, and the stuff we don't care about, at least at that, that point of time, is whatever is happening on the beacon chain. I however, do expect that with time, as we, we get more closer to figuring things out, Scout is going to grow a bit more complex, because it has to take in more things from, from the different phases. But right now, it's pretty simple. Um, that's the, the original announcement URL. You can read a bit more uh, reasoning and, and you know how does it work. Um, but the, the URL, the, the GitHub URL, is where all the, the code is. So Scout itself, there, there are a couple of different Scouts, actually. I'm going to go into that. But the thing we, we call Scout is this, well, OK, there was a nice Cool. Um, so basically, Scout does a couple of different things uh, under the same name. So it, had, it is this tool, but it also defines the APIs based on the proposal. Uh, it has a testing format. Uh, and it has a couple of example EEs. We, we're going to go into that in a second. Um, so the original, original Scout I'm mostly talking about is written in Rust. And it's, it's really small. It started out as like 300 lines of code. That's, that's all what was needed to implement Proposal 2 uh, in a Blackbox manner. It uses WASMI, which is a WASM interpreter. It's not a compiler engine. It's, it's an interpreter. It's written in Rust. Um, but the way Scout is written, you can, you can swap out to, to different engines. This engine stuff will be important uh, later on. Um, and the E's are WASM bytecodes. codes. We covered that a couple of times already. But there's this other Scout today, Scout.ts, which implements the same API but is written in TypeScript. Um, and that uses, of course, Node, so it uses a fast compiler engine. Uh, therefore, you can do more stuff in time. Uh, but a quick question. Did anybody of you see yesterday uh, the was on 1.0 session with benchmarking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know from that that we want to use fast interpreters. So V8 is not something you would use uh, 
at least soon. It's not something you would use. So if you use Scouted TS to benchmark your EE, if you happen to prototyping some EEs, so the numbers you get there is, is probably something you shouldn't take seriously. Uh, you have to use interpreters to, to get the, the actual numbers. Uh, Scout TS can be found there. One other interesting point is that with the Rust, Rust version, uh, Scout itself is the thing you can execute EEs, but there's also a library to write EEs in Rust, and you can compile that Rust code to Wasm. And with the TypeScript, there's this other language called AssemblyScript, uh, which looks like TypeScript but compiles to Wasm. So in the Scout TS repo, we have a hello world written in AssemblyScript. Um, I'm just highlighting this that you can actually write contracts, write EEs, pardon, so write EEs in different languages. And there's another Scout as well, called Scout1, which is written in C++, and that's going to use uh, Webit, the optimized interpreter uh, we have. So this is the, the Scout version eventually you want to use to get the final numbers which would reflect what's going on on the network. Okay, so what are EEs? Uh, quick recap, they are basically the contracts in the chart. And they only have a limited access. They, they are pure functions, that all, all they do. They get, on the input side, they get this data blob, which is, which contains the proof uh, of the previous state. So you take that, that proof and you construct the previous state, you end up with the same state root. And that's the other thing you get as an input, the actual state root, which is stored on the shard. Well, that's a proposal too anyway, because that might change. Um, but you get the state root from the shard, and then you supply all the proofs to recalculate the same state root, and you have to validate that it matches. And that means you, you have a good starting point. And then you also receive, in the same data blob, all the transactions, all the things you want to do. So you apply those changes, you calculate the, the final state root, the post state root, and that's what you output and that's what's stored. So that, that's all what EEs can do. So this is the API. Uh, <coughs> the API in, in S was in host functions. So the, just to explain it a bit. So this E2 stuff here is a namespace and this is the function name and these are the parameters. So what I just explained, you have a way to get the data, you have a way to get the pre and, the, and set the post state root. The deposit stuff I wouldn't really pay too much attention to right now because that might change quite a bit. Uh, but we also have a debugging API because why don't you want to have a debugging API? Uh, it's an easy way to get some values out of the EE during execution. So you can print numbers, you can print memory, uh, you can print memory in a, in a hexadecimal form. But this one, print mem only prints memory, only the printable characters. So essentially, it's usable for printing strings. Uh, and we have a big num, a big num API. So that's, that was mentioned yesterday during the, the benchmarking. Um, it's not fixed at all. But that is the discussion URL uh, to discuss what the big num API should look like. This is one of the current proposals. It matches what is implemented in the TypeScript in the Rust version but it may change in the future. Um, so regarding the EEs, we have in, in Scout itself, we have two examples, the Hello World and Bazaar. Uh, I'm gonna have some screenshots afterwards. Uh, and we have a bunch of other examples, but they're not necessarily in the same place. Uh, and these, all these examples are gonna be, all these execution environments gonna be covered today. So here's an example in Rust, if anybody's familiar with Rust. Uh, as I said, you load. Uh, here, basically, what this other word is doing, you expect that there's no change, no inputs. So obviously, the pre and the post state would match. Um, but it's just an example to see how to use the APIs. And that's the same in assembly script. And another weird language called list, which also compiles to wasm. Uh, this is a longer example. This is the, the, the baseline to, to all of the work we have done, because basically this doesn't do any kind of compression or any sparse multi trees. It just takes in the data, hashes it, and that's it. So basically, this is the state, which is a list of messages. A message contains of just a message in the timestamp. And the input block has to supply 
every single time the, the state. Because what you store is the hash of all the messages. So obviously, you, you need all of that at the input side again. So this is not really useful. It's useful as an example, but it wouldn't really scale. Um, so that's why we have all these discussions afterwards. And I mentioned that you can interact with Sky through a YAML file. So this is an example of the, the YAML file. Uh, you specify what is the code you want to run, the pre-state, the post-state, and the data. And you can also run multiple scripts in the same YAML file. It doesn't have to be a core single one. Um, you're going to see these YAML files in the repos for every single EE. So the next steps. Uh, I haven't mentioned, but uh, we have worked with the Quill team, and they have taken Scout to be integrated into Lighthouse to do some kind of a, a, a testing or a simulation. Uh, but we actually are thinking about to to move all, all of that code back and, and just have it in Scout and have an independent tool to do rapid prototyping. Um, but we do want to add a, a few things there, maybe multiple engines, and a Scout one, of course, and make just the, the developer experience better, have better tools around. That's what we have on Scout. Uh, do you guys have, are we on time? We have two minutes, right? So maybe one, one or two questions. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I will repeat. Yeah. yeah, so this is not really a question about scout, but more about EE. So pre-state groups and post-state groups sounds like they are assumed to be hash groups, but <coughs> are, is it up to the EE to use those 32 bytes however it wishes? Yeah, so the question was that it assumes it's, um, it just hashes, and the, the state root is just a hash. And it's not actually limited to 32 bytes. Uh, it sh there's a proposal to, to make it longer, I think 96 bytes or something. But anyway, it's, it's definitely less than 256 bytes, uh, what the state rule is. And it's up to the EE to do whatever it wants with it. Um, yeah. Go ahead, please. Uh, is there a CAPI for Scout? Uh, you mean, so is there a CAPI for Scout? Did, did you mean writing? EEs in C or no no can run. we use Scout uh, from uh, any language that can run C? Yeah, so Scout one would be is written in C plus plus, so that would be the best one to use in, in C. Uh, you know, calling it from C. And there was one more question back there. Uh, it's just a quick one. With the um, presumably the main activity is going to be in the, the Rust implementation of scouts and then you, know, yeah. you mentioned the C++ one which sounds like it's more for benchmarking and getting the most accurate numbers there. Um, the assembly script one, I guess it's that if you, if you want to work with assembly scripts and presumably the, the actual Rust ones where you, know, you as a team are focusing most of your effort, is that fair to say? So, so the question was what is the motivation for each of these different versions of scout? Um, and so a distinction, just the, the languages used to write the contracts in versus what the scout is written in, because you mentioned the send script. Um, so regarding just how the, the way you run these contracts, um, it depends on personal preference between the, the Rust and the, the TypeScript version, which one do you like more? Um, but on more on a production system, we expect that scout on the C++ version is the one which is going to be used. Um, the other two are more for prototyping reasons. Uh, one interesting uh, fact with the TypeScript version is that you could use it in a browser. So you wouldn't even need an environment. Um, but I, I think they're really just a personal preference which one you want to use for day-to-day for -day prototyping. Mm -hmm. Scout 1 would be what you should use to validate that your stuff actually going to work. And then regarding the contract languages, the assembly script versus writing contracts, contracts in Rust or EEs or in C. Uh, it's again down to personal preference, but each of them have different ways to optimize uh, the code to be efficient in one. You have better experience with one or the other depending on the use case. Um, and that's, that's actually one of the, the biggest challenges to, to figure out what is the, the best way to, to optimize these uh, high level languages for WASM. Okay, so, so you're not necessarily encouraging people to focus on any specific one as such, it's more okay with what you want to work with right now. Yeah, yeah, I would say. I think we're, we should be moving on the time, right? So, see you. Okay.
So Sina and Guillaume from the Wasm team are talking about Turbo Proof and Turbo Token. I'm sure it will be really interesting. Thanks for the intro, Alex. Um, apparently, this click does have a timer. I'm just going to set it up. All right, um, so now that we, we've seen what EEs are and how we can test them and prototype them, we're going to go into uh, a sample um, token EE. And our constraint here is that we want to have a token EE that is compatible with ETH1, the ETH1 chain that we know and love. Um, the outline of this talk will be uh, as follows. First, we will go into SMPT, which is which was our initial prototype um, of a stateless token. It was um, implemented in Rust, as we'll see. Um, then we'll go into a multi-proof scheme for the Merkle uh, Patricia tree, which uh, Guillaume will explain. And then um, we'll see Turbo Token, which is another EE similar to SMPT, but it uses the multi-proof scheme and comes, off, uh, comes uh, with a lot of uh, optimizations. So yeah, SMPT is a stateless token uh, compatible with ETH1. And what I mean uh, with that is, given the same accounts, uh, it will have to produce the same state route. And we also want to enable users to, uh, to sign transactions with their ETH1 uh, private keys. Uh, this initial prototype was uh, in Rust, and it uses uh, parity libraries. In order to maintain user balances, uh, we store the key, uh, the accounts in the leaves of a Merkle Patricia tree that you can see in this diagram. Uh, so the accounts are very similar to ETH1 accounts, the same. Uh, here are the leaves. Uh, yeah, you can see branch nodes, extension nodes, and so on. Uh, but note that, uh, as we all know, this is stateless. So this uh, uh, state is not stored on chain. But we rely on third-party entities called relayers to store this state and provide uh, the service to users. Uh, so users, when they want to uh, send a transaction, they sign the transaction, send it to the relayer, which then attaches uh, necessary Merkle proofs for the sender and recipient to the transaction, packages multiple of these into a block, and publishes it to the network. Um, looking from outside, the EE would take this block data as well as the pre-state root, which is in the shard state, um, and it, it will have to produce a post-state root. And now going inside, um, of course, the, the EE will first have to decode the block data, and this block data is comprised of a list of transactions. Um, it's very similar to, to ETH1, so we have the two address value non signature. Additionally, we have the f uh, proof for the sender's account and as well as the recipient's account. And now, um, for each of the transactions, we verify the signature, we verify the, the Merkle proofs, uh, check for nonce and balances, and then update uh, the leaves of the tree for those accounts. Uh, after every transaction has been processed, uh, we can finally compute the post state route. Uh, to evaluate this prototype, we simulated 5,000 accounts in the state and 70 transactions. Uh, and run it through Scout with uh, the WASMI interpreter. And these are the results we got. So, Block size here is 235 kilobytes for the 70 transactions, and speed is five seconds, out of which uh, four seconds is for signature verification. But don't panic just yet. We'll get much better results uh, very soon, by the end of this talk. Um, now, let's go back to the, the, the same diagram. Uh, let's say we have a transaction that wants to prove uh, these two accounts. Um, as you will notice, the nodes that I've highlighted in red will be duplicated in both of the proofs, which is inefficient. So 
if we could have a multi-proof scheme that includes all the necessary nodes but only once, we would reduce the block size and with a good algorithm we could also gain efficiency in the runtime by batching the verification. And Guillaume will now talk about such a scheme. Well, thanks for Sina, but he's coming back, so just, <laughs> just to wait. Um, yeah, so I would like to talk about Turbo Proof. That, so that used to be called Multi Proof, but apparently uh, everybody starts calling their own scheme Multi Proof. So I, I had, to, well, actually Sina came up with a new scheme name. Uh, so it has been invented by uh, Alexei, uh, Alexei Akunov, who uh, uh, was uh, using it for uh, for a. Uh, light client uh, purpose, so it's really designed to to make uh, rebuilding the tree fa fast. And uh, we want to use it because well, we're uh, interested. But there are several reasons why we want to use it. It's really bound to the ETH1 Merkle Pat Patricia tree, and also uh, we since there's going to be an ETH1 EE uh, integrated in uh, in ETH2. Uh, we, we figured it, it would make sense to, to study that. So there are three implementations. The first one is described by Alexa himself. Um, the other two are the ones uh, Sina and I wrote in uh, TypeScript and Rust. And uh, yeah, I'm going to explain how the later, uh, latter two work. Uh, yes. So we start uh, with a tree, so it's the same tree. Um, and uh, we want, imagine uh, you want to make a proof that uh, you know the values of those two, those two leaves. So you start uh, by selecting the nodes. So you, if you want those two, node, uh, those two leaves, you, this is uh, in red the path that you will have to travel, which means that everything that is left will be hashed. So this is roughly the, the tree that you're going to, to send over. And then you just get all the nodes and you put them in a depth first um, um, uh, order. So uh, you don't actually need to store the two full nodes here, but they're they're here to help uh, understand the, the the representation. Uh, then uh, Alex uh, started uh, using uh, wanted to use uh, some kind of virtual machine to start reconstructing the proof. So basically, the proof reconstruction, like how how the instruction on how to rebuild the tree is used, uh, is encoded as a program. So a leaf means you have a list of leaves, you pick the, the leaf at the top of that list. Extension it just means you take whatever is on the stack and you add it as a node, as a sub-node uh, of that extension. Branch and add uh, do the same thing. The branch actually creates the branch node and add just says uh, you have a branch node on the stack, you have a uh, no, another node on the stack, so you have at least two nodes on the stack, and you make the the child node the parent of uh, sorry, the the child of this uh, of this uh, previous branch node. And finally, a hash. There's also a list of hashes. So you grab it says you grab the first hash in that list uh, available in that list, and you put it on the stack. Uh, <coughs> so I'm going to run through a, a program. So this is uh, the program that encodes the. Um, the whole uh, st structural information. So you start, you know, here you have the stack, right now it's empty, you have the list of hashes, and you have uh, the list of nodes. And so what you do is you start with the first instruction, it's a leaf, you put it on the stack, another leaf, so now you have two leaves on the stack, oh by the way I should have specified that the stack grows in that direction. Um, then the next uh, instruction is a branch, so you grab the the branch node and you take the leaf that was first on the stack uh, and you make make it a, a child um, and then after that there's an add so the add takes the the branch plus child and uh, another node and is going to make that node the, the child of uh, of the top node so that's what you get um, yeah there's a bit of a squiggle here but uh, yeah that's uh, generated then uh, there's an extension node here and an extension instruction. So this is uh, what happens. And uh, finally, well, finally, there's a branch. So you create uh, the branch like this. And at this point, you, the next instruction is hash. So you're going to take the hash from the list of hashes and put it on the stack. So it's independent uh, at the moment. And then finally, you perform the, the last instruction, which is the add and it adds the, the hash to, to the node. And by the way, there's another mistake here. It should be D, not C, that the hash is coming from. Um, yeah, so uh, it's, uh, it's 
pretty simple, relatively simple. Uh, it has a lot of uh, inefficiency that in get inherited from uh, from the Merkle Patricia, Patricia tree. It uses RLP. Uh, it's nibble based, so that makes a lot of unnecessary copies, a lot of unnecessary uh, uh, breaks in in the key. Uh, there's a write-up uh, that is ready, uh, that is almost ready. That it's uh, I'm collecting feedback and I'm going to publish it soon. And uh, yes, uh, so far to uh, serialize the proof, we use RLP. Um, there's uh, Proto Lambda who's uh, working on a better way to encode uh, the same tree without the structural information. So there's some work uh, in that direction that's really interesting and that I encourage you to, to look at when it's, uh, when it's published. Uh, and with this, uh, Sina is going to tell us what to do with this uh, turbo proof. So um, now that we've seen how Turbo Proof works, we can um, go to our latest uh, prototype, which was uh, the majority of which was implemented by, by Casey in Assembly Script. This is the language that looks like TypeScript, but it's totally different, and it compiles to uh, Wasm. So Turbo Token has uh, a bunch of differences to SMPT. I won't go into all of them. But um, one of the like, bigger changes is that the block data looks different. It's not only a list of transactions anymore. We also include some additional information for the EE. And we sort them in a way uh, so that the EE could, um, without many memory copies and without many lookups, uh, process the transactions. And I won't go into details here, but uh, you can see uh, how the block data looks like looks like. Um, so to process each transaction, we recover uh, the sender's address from the signature. Uh, we get the accounts for the sender and the recipient uh, with just a simple index-based lookup from an array, um, check nonce, make sure there is enough funds. Uh, and then we update the accounts, uh, the account objects, not in the tree, but just the account object itself, and then RLP encoded. And then you might notice that one of the differences here is that we are not doing the proof verification here. That we are doing afterwards. So after every transaction has been processed, uh, we hash all of the uh, addresses to get the list of three keys. Um, and then in a single pass, uh, we do a couple of things. Um, as we are rebuilding the tree, similar to how, how Guillaume explained, we hash the, the, the existing leaves uh, to compute the pre-state root. At the same time, in a different stack, we uh, hash the updated accounts to get the post-state root. And uh, additionally, we also reconstruct the paths of each of these leaves uh, to get, uh, to get the the, the keys for those leaves. Uh, we want to do this because otherwise I could send a transaction with my own address, but then in the multi-proof include Vitalik's account, which has much more leaves than me. So uh, this is crucial. And notice here, again, this is done in a single pass, and this was empired by Paul's jungle token. Um, then, as you saw, um, signature verification was a major bottleneck in SMPT, which was taking four out of five seconds. So to remedy that, uh, Casey took uh, WebSnark, uh, which is a, a library of optimized WASM code for elliptic curve and SNARK primitives. He adapted it to uh, the SEGP256K1 curve, uh, which ETH1 uses. He also replaced the, the big num arithmetics with the big num API. And this all resulted in a major runtime uh, improvement. Uh, another thing that we do is uh, optimized RLP encoding and decoding. Um, and so we, we, instead of having a generic uh, encode and decode, we have specific encoders and decoders for every data structure. This is because, for example, for a branch node, we know how it's going to look like. We have much more information, so we can encode or decode 
with a lot less uh, memory copies or overhead. And to, to evaluate, we took the same test case, so 5,000 accounts, 70 transactions, and here are the results we got. So in SMPT, as you remember, uh, the block size was uh, 235 kilobytes, and in Turbo Token, that's 50 kilobytes. And for runtime, in WASMI, we had uh, five seconds. Uh, for, for Turbo Token, we ran the EE in an optimized Rabbit, and it took uh, 140 milliseconds, out of which uh, 105 milliseconds is for signature verification, but KC thinks that that still can go down uh, three times. Uh, please also note that this is a, this is a lower bound because currently uh, Turbo Token is only limited to updating existing leads. It doesn't uh, add new accounts to the try or uh, remove them. And in order to do that, we'll have to um, adjust the algorithm, which will incur some overhead. So, so what we saw so far, oh wait, how much time do we have? All right, so I guess we can take questions. Yes. So in that example try, it was a pretty small try, but I'm curious about the benchmarks. Uh, was that on a, on a like, large try? Or a small one? It was with uh, 5,000 accounts in the state. 5, yeah, so, so this is, yeah, this is a, a pathological, as Paul likes to call it, uh, example. Uh, it doesn't represent a, a real workload. That's uh, one of the things that we want to do as a next step. But um, it was also like one of uh, the reasons we chose this uh, test case is because the constraints that we have or we think we have, we will have for the EE is uh, around 50 kilobytes of data in the block size. So we set everything up so that the data would roughly fit uh, in 50 kilobytes. And, and uh, for runtime, it's likely going to be around 100 milliseconds. Uh, have you considered or uh, there is any chance that the state, instead of being in a Patricia tree, be in a Sparks Merkle tree? Uh, yes, and in fact, we will, we will see that uh, very soon in the next uh, talks. This is, as, as I said, like one of the major constraints that we had for this prototype is that we wanted to remain compatible with ETH1. Okay, if there's no more questions, um, so far what we saw was just uh, ETH1 compatible token EE, but of course we would want a fully fledged ETH1 EE. And for that purpose, among other things, we will need a EVM interpreter in, in what? Yes? Uh, did you have like a GitHub link where we can find the source code of this prototype? Yeah, um, yeah, sorry. I, uh, yeah, yeah um, I think there is. Um, yeah, so this is Turbo Token. Uh, this is the Rust implementation of uh, Turbo Proof. Okay, so uh, for, for, for the EVM interpreter in, in Wasm, uh, I invite Hugo um, to talk about his work. Can somebody check at the door if the AC is turned on? Um, I'm going to talk about this uh, EVM interpreter execution environment, how it works, uh, a couple of examples, and what needs to be done. Uh, this execution environment is written in assembly script, and it runs on the it runs on a fork of, of Scout, where I added um, some more host functions in order to um, process some of the opcodes. Uh, the way it works, um, it defines an EVM stack uh, in the WASM memory, where each element in the stack is a 256-bit uh, um, 
element, so it, it is basically the same EVM one. It also defines an EVM memory, and later it calls these two um, host functions to tell a Scout in which part of the WASM memory uh, the stack, uh, the EVM stack, and the EVM uh, memory exist. Then it gets the EVM bytecode and the input data directly from the from the block data. And once we have the EVM bytecode, it iterates iterates the bytecode and execute uh, uh, interpret each one of the of the opcodes. Uh, the majority of the opcodes are implemented uh, directly in assembly script. But there are some other opcodes, uh, for example, this one, that instead of being implemented directly in assembly script, it calls a host function. Um, basically, are the the opcodes that deals with big num operations. And these are a couple of examples. Uh, this is a very simple EVM bytecode, which just um, first puts the number one to the to the EVM stack then push again another number one to the EVM stack, and then run execute the add opcode, so we have the number two in the stack, and then we store this, uh, this number two from the stack to the, to the EVM memory. And at the end, we return this um, result, which is number two, and we write this on the, on the post that, that some, someone asked before if we can do whatever we want with the you know, pre-state post-state. So we can take this um, EVM bytecode and put it in a in a scout um, test case where we put the, the bytecode and the expected result here. And if we execute this test case, we get uh, this result, which basically says that confirms that the expected what we expected is is what actually we get. For example, if for some reason I change this. Um, this test case and I say that one plus one is equals three, the scout will show something like this. It will show that there's a difference between the execution and what we expected. And this is another example. Um, in this case, the EVM bytecode is um, generated by the Solidity, compi Solidity compiler. So, we are, we are sending this uh, EVM bytecode as well as the input data. And again, ah, yeah, for, for, for getting the result of this, um, of this contract, I also run it in, in Ethereum GSVM. And the same result that are, we are getting in Ethereum GSVM, I'm expecting to be the result in the execution of the, of the execution environment. So we run this uh, test case and the scout confirms that we are, what we expected is what we are getting. So what are the next steps? What still needs to be done? Um, the first things that need to be done is to actually use the scout uh, stateless capabilities, which means that we need at first, we need to have a pre root and instead of uh, adding the EVM bytecode directly in the block data, we need to um, instead add uh, a list of transactions and a list of proof nodes uh, corresponding to the accounts and the contracts affected by those transactions. And we also need to, to add a um, poster route where um, this reflects the result or the or the changes made in those transactions. Uh, another things that another thing that needs to be done is a test with more uh, more contracts. Uh, it could be testing with the with the contracts in the Ethereum tests uh, in the in the main Ethereum test. And finally, the uh, one important thing that needs to be done is uh, benchmarking, and that's it. Um, 
Is there any question? Yeah. How does it deal with context uh, of code, like block uh, number and timestamp? Uh, is that provided as an input? Um, so sorry, for your like of code is like timestamp and block number. Um, no, I'm not considering that uh, yet. Uh, okay, I thought you implemented the E1, yeah, the old EVM of code? Uh, not yet. Uh, not we need to code. keep testing with all the contracts. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so this is built as part of the EVM ones, the E1 switchover idea. And I think one of the, the plans is to, to probably integrate this into Turbo Token. And at that point, you would want to have some kind of a compressed form of the entire E1 blocks to be transmitted. But of course, you need the proofs as well. Uh, but the, the block data would, would have the timestamp and all other fields you need. Thanks, Atlas. Hi guys, my name is Matt. I am with the Gold Team. I'm going to tell you about Sheath, another token environment. So the name Sheath comes from Shard Ether Manager. It's a token transfer execution environment, just like you saw with Sina and Guillaume, and just like you'll see with Paul after me. It's written in Rust, and it provides a few things for you. It provides an execution environment, which is like a WebAssembly binary that you give to the beacon chain and it's executed on the shards. It gives a CLI tool to build uh, random transaction packages, and the proofs that go along with that transaction package so it can be executed statelessly. And it gives some testing and debugging tools because compiling to WebAssembly for Rust is still not the most ergonomical thing. And it helps kind of streamline that process and streamline the process of running your execution environment through Skeleton. So when I started out with building Sheath, the design goals for Sheath were we were trying to make a token transfer environment that had a really small WebAssembly binary. We wanted to have really small proof sizes to execute on, and we wanted to do that really fast. And it turns out that we're still working on those things because they're not as easy as um, it's just doing. And so right now I'm trying to make it as like a really hackable thing. And what do I mean by hackable? I mean, it's something that like you at a hackathon can go in and fork and start swapping out components and start experimenting with what an execution environment is and does. Um, you can put your own logic in it. And it's hopefully really readable because it should be like fairly idiomatic rust where uh, speed is not incredibly compromised. So if there's one thing to take from this is to try and fork sheath and, and give a go at it. So the general architecture of what's happening is kind of laid out here and like this base layer is sheath and that's kind of just provides some like rails for you to build an execution environment on top of. And so each of these like kind of components are things that you can kind of you can swap out and put like whatever you want here. And so uh, the base layer is kind of the database that you operate on, your like multi-proof that Sina and Guillaume talked about. And so my implementation is like a sparse Merkle tree. I'm I'm calling it imp because it's an imp place multi-proof, but you can swap that out for uh, Patricia Merkle tree or any other kind of proof format that you like. Uh, all that it has to do is has, it has to implement a trait that has kind of these functions. So you need to be able to figure out what the value an account is, what that account's nonce is, and you need to be able to add and subtract values um, and increase the nonce for those accounts. Uh, and then there's a few types of transfers for execution environments in 2.0. And so the transfer, deposit, and withdraw, the deposit and withdraw are like beacon chain related functions. That's how you move ether from one shard to the other. Transfer is how uh, you transfer between accounts. But if you want to fork this and hack out your own things, this is where you can add and, and swap out and put whatever kind of trans transactions you want as long as you update them in the TX interpreter. So what is M? Well, it's, uh, it's an in-place multi-merkle proof. And it's kind of born from the simple serializes algorithm for merkleizing very large lists. It's, uh, it uses a sparse Merkle tree and it merkleizes things in the same way that SST spec defines like merkleization to happen. Um, and it's optimized to perform read writes and reading in place. 
because the original iteration of this execution environment, I just used a hash table to um, to back all of my uh, nodes and my Merkle stuff, and I found that the execution environment uh, was dominated by mem copies, and so that's not what we want. We want to kind of treat this like an embedded environment and take advantage of every cycle. And so doing it in a place turned out to be more efficient. And so the, uh, the citation here is for Proto Lambda. He kind of came up with this method. So this is like a GitHub link to his, to his repo where he like first kind of describes it. And we'll kind of come back to this, but let's do uh, an SSC review. How does everyone feel on SSC? Good? Good? <laughs> Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of go over like how containers work in SSZ because that's what I, I really, how containers and list works, that's what I really care about. So for, uh, on the left side, it's kind of like the object that we're gonna talk about, on the right side is the tree that it represents. So in SSZ, if I wanna Merkleize an object that has one value, bytes 32, then it's the root of that, the Merkle root of that uh, container is actually exactly the value because it's only 32 bytes and each node in a Merkle tree for SSZ is 32 bytes. Uh, if we have a container with two elements, and these are U128s, so that's only 16 bytes, uh, we Merkleize it where it's got a tree of, of one depth and two children. So because there are 16 bytes, we theoretically could put them together into one node like we had here. Um, but for like access reasons and proving reasons, it's better to split it out, split the containers out based on um, each of the members of, of the container. So for list, you can see that it has the same structure, even though now it has three elements. So on the right side, it says the maximum elements you can have in this list. And here it's the same structure as the container with two elements of the same size. And the reason is, is because here in that left node, we're packing um, all two values in them because they have 32 bytes in total. And on the right, we only have one value and 16 bytes of padding. So now as we grow to another container that's a little bit bigger, you can kind of see that uh, the number of leaves is equal to uh, the next power of two of the number of elements you have in your container. So here we have three elements, the next power of two is four. And we have each node being um, the values in the container padded to 16 bytes since they're U1, uh, U128s. And then the last node here is just a zero padded node. So in sheath, there's uh, the concept of an account, and this is what the account tree in sheath looks like. So every leaf of my sparse Merkle tree is that root for the account, and it has this kind of structure. So the bottom left two nodes is a bytes 48, that's the VLS public key. Um, then we've got the nonce, the value, and then the way that SSD Merkleizes things, like we saw on the last slide, is we've got the padding here uh, for the, the, the fourth leaf. So if I want to prove an account value, then all I need is I just need these three nodes. I need that top left node, and I need the value node, and then the padding node. And theoretically, like, we don't really need the padding node since it's just zeros. So what does the like state tree for sheath look like, or like just a general execution environment? Well, the way that I've gone, the route I've gone down is that it's going to be a sparse Merkle tree. And so I don't know if you can read this, but it says list of accounts, which was this structure, and there's two to the 256 of those accounts. Um, and so like, what does that look like? Uh, it's too big to film the slide, so I'll just like, kind of leave it as an exercise to think about it in your head. But if we were to kind of do it, it might look something like this, where at the very top of a tree that has 256 depth, you've got a root, and then like the, if you take left 256 times, you'll get to an account with address zero. Um, if you go right 256 times, you get to an account uh, root node with uh, address of 2 to the 256 minus 1. So back to the M format, um, the M format that lets us do in place Merkleization, Merkle operations. Uh, it's kind of built into two, two main portions. This left portion here is the offsets, and so the offsets is what lets us traverse this uh, hashes object. And you can kind of think of this hashes object as like a contiguous array of 32 byte values. And some of those values are like internal nodes of your Merkle tree, and some of them are like in nodes that are the actual values we care about, like the account balance, the nonce, et cetera. And so we use the offsets to traverse these hashes. Um, I can run through this algorithm. If people have questions on execution environments and rather do some questions, I, I can do that instead. Does anyone have a preference? Okay, let's run through it quickly and then do questions. So let's generate the offsets. So right here I say we've got offsets. We already know the hashes because we've got the Merkle tree. We need to figure out the offsets so that we can later traverse it. 
So we can think of a Merkle tree of depth uh, three here. And we can think of these numbers as like kind of like the general index. This is like defining uh, which node we're talking about. And you can start with the top node, and that's one. And then you can say two, three, just like kind of in order traversal all the way down the tree. So say that we've got this proof right here. We want to say we're trying to prove 12. And the nodes we want we need to provide this like in the stateless multi-proof to prove 12 is 2, 12, 13, 7. So what we do is we kind of like bring those down and these, this is kind of like the order that these hashes will be stored uh, in our like contiguous array of hashes for M. So now let's generate those, those offsets. So the first thing to do is we start like at the very top and it's kind of like this recursive thing. We say, how many um, nodes is in the left subtree of this like entire, this entire tree that we're looking at? And well, like in that case it's four because we can just like kind of count the number of nodes that we're providing in this proof, one, two, three, four. And so that's like the first number of uh, the offsets. And so we start continuing to traverse down uh, to the left and now that we're at one, we say, okay, how many nodes is in the left subtree from one? And, uh, it's just a two node there because we're not providing anything below. We're only providing that one because that's the only thing we need to, to prove 12. And so in that case, it's one. So we come down to two now. We're still traversing left first. And there's no nodes in that left subtree of two. So we can skip over to three. And we ask how many nodes is in the three subtree. It's just 12 and 13. So we can put two in our offsets. Uh, we come down to six. Same question, how many nodes is in the left subtree? One. Uh, go down to 12, well there's no, no nodes where to leaf. And now we come to 7, and we, we do include 7 in the proof, but it has no children, so uh, it can kind of be inferred just from the offsets that we've already come up with. So this is, this is what it, like, kind of an in proof is. We've got these offsets that we generated, like 4, 2, 4, 1, 2, 1, and the branch that we need to provide to prove uh, the, this general, this node at, at index 12, the branch is not actually the, the branch indices, it's actually the hash. 32 bytes. Uh, it's just easier to like reason about if I just show the branch indices. Um, how are we doing on time? My timer went away. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Okay. So right now this is like the size of. So I so I told you that there's a there's a tool to generate these multi proofs and this is the size I'm getting right now. Um, and, and you can read them, but I would say that these numbers like aren't super accurate until we do these optimizations. So the first optimization is the offsets are represent, represented by U64s, and I'm never gonna provide enough hashes to need all of those bits of uh, significance. So I could probably get away with like U16 or something. But the more important one is that right now I'm including zero hashes, and if you're familiar with the structure of a sparse Merkle tree, there's a lot of zero hashes, especially at the lower levels of your tree. And so until these optimizations are done, these numbers are kind of just like, waving around in the air. So I told you about uh, how to create the offsets, but there's the, these algorithms that you need to do to look up values and, and uh, do the virtualization. So if you're interested in like like understanding those algorithms, you can read Proto Lambda's uh, uh, kind of paper that he published on GitHub. And then I've got two implementations. I did one in Rust and then I did one in Python. Uh, this Python one's way more readable than the Rust one, as most Python things typically are. Um, if you want to learn more about Sheath, if you want to fork it and try and hack it at the next hackathon or whatever, the repository is github.com slash lightclient slash sheath. And I would check out the hacking.md file. It's a pretty good guide on like where to get started if you want to like kind of play around with Sheath. Feel free to ping me on Twitter. My handle is Matt, Matt underscore uh, Garnett. Uh, and, or you can just find me uh, at the conference. I'm happy to like, talk to you some more about Sheath. So thank you. Does anybody have any questions? I don't know how much time have any time for questions. Okay, yeah, one or two questions. Yes? What do you think it takes to build out uh, execution environments from here and then do more than transfers? To do, from here to do more than transfers, um, people. Um, I, I feel like a lot of the, the framework is there and I just, like, I personally don't have time to build, like, more exciting ones, but I've, I've been thinking about it. It's like really, you just have to like go back to like the very beginning of this like slide. I don't know if I get there fast enough. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, it's really just like replacing these kind of, uh, like these concepts, transfer, deposit, withdraw. Like if I want to do like a, a bounties contract uh, EE, it would just be like, instead of transfer, it would be create bounty. 
and an interpreter would interpret some way and then I would change kind of, these are like the variables in your solidity contract. That's kind of like the same like uh, similarity. And so it's possible to do it. You can fork it from here and do it. It's just you need to spend some time and think about it and actually implement it. So just asked me if the Zero Cash can, uh, Zero Hashes can be fixed and optimized out. For example, by adding one bit in some setting. So is there any expected savings? Uh, any early numbers that we can do right now? Uh, not really, but it's a, I have come up with like, kind of, so similar to the way that the turbo proofs are done with the opcodes, I've kind of come up with a way of uh, compressing like the offset concept here, and I think that that can provide like a good way of removing the zero hashes. Um, and the basic idea is like, if you're kind of traversing those offsets, I didn't go through the algorithm to traverse it, but you traverse like through the same uh, the same direction for like many different levels and you should just be able to compress that and by compressing that you would know that those are zero hashes that hash them in that order. Yeah, so I don't have any numbers on that yet. So next up is Paul Luzanski. He's going to talk about his uh, stateless Merkle tree token. It's uh, a little bit more efficient than what I have so far. Hmm, lots of work. Um, to write, to write these up. It's a one slide presentation, by the way, for me. Lots of work um, to write EDs, but I think uh, the question is how to make it usable. I think that this is the base, because it's the stateless uh, uh, model, and I'll explain this in a moment. Um, so everything is stateless in, in F2, so how many DAP developers do we have in the room? I'm curious. So a few. So this is sort of what the, what the, who this talk is targeted at, but there's less than I expected to be here. Um, but for, for maybe uh, everyone is interested, how are we going to do stateless? What's the throughput? What, you know, how, does, how is this even going to work? Um, you know, if we have stateless, we're passing so many hashes in with the call data. This dominates the call data. And how, what, is it going to be like one transaction per second, two? I mean, is it, does this even make sense to begin with? And that's what I thought about, and I was, I, I didn't think it was going to work. And I, I have a little bit more hope now. It might work. Um, but we have to be very careful in this, this for the DAP developers in the room, uh, this is sort of the basis, uh, uh, these Merkle, uh, uh, having state. So you want to persist state, but you have to, you know, hash it up somehow. We know that there are other accumulators. There's R, there are RSA, maybe some zero knowledge stuff. And I think those have big uh, use cases, but I think that the Merkle uh, trees also have big use cases, but we need trees that have like depth millions, not just like, you know, thousands, we need millions uh, of, in depth. Um, so that's the big problem, that's the big challenge. We need breakthroughs and we need, you know, efficient Merkle trees for, to make F2, the stateless idea, even work to begin with. So, so that was my, you know, I thought about this for a long time. Um, so the two big things are call data size and runtime. And there are trade-offs between them. Of course, there are speeds, size, speed trade-offs. Um, but so I'm going to explain. Uh, 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 I wrote everything in C, by the way. Show of hands, C fans, C programming links. Okay, great. So there are people. Maybe they're not interested in writing DAPs in C, but I think C is a reasonable language. Uh, I think we have to be efficient also uh, when we're writing EEs. Everything has to be, you know, micromanaged. We like, you know, embedded systems. Uh, we have limited, you know, memory, limited uh, uh, cycles, CPU cycles, so we have to do everything. Uh, we have to l listen to the embedded systems people and do everything as efficiently as possible. Um, and there are, you know, many years of accumulated knowledge in this kind of area. So call data size, so two, so millions, four million, two to the 22 uh, in accounts in the state, 40 accounts in the witness. What's the best? Uh, we can pass, We want to be dominated by hashes and signatures, uh, or whatever uh, uh, for signatures for the transactions. I'm sorry if if your if your DAP is using, but, but that's the goal is to be dominated by hashes. And then the tree structure, you know, the theoretical limit is zero percent of your call data is for the tree structure. But I I, I can get it less less than one percent. So that's sort of a, a great thing. But there's hope. Uh, so you know this is the best we can possibly do is just dominated by hashes. And this is for 25 kilobytes, so it's close to F1 stuff, but you can double it so you can say 80. But it's a little better because um, 
there are two things, the, the two first two tricks, and then two, two more tricks that are being worked on, and then another sort of few things. We need like two, uh, two orders of magnitude increase, and another one, and another big trick, and another big trick. We need a bunch of those two x increases to make this even feasible. But I think it, it, it might be possible. Um, so binary tree is the first thing. Uh, uh, why is binary tree more efficient uh, uh, than the hex area? You saw that the tree with the 16 leaves, and then these trees have sort of two leaves each. Okay, why uh, why is binary better than hex area? Because then you need all the others on the level to be able to hack it back. Yes. So, so for four, for, sorry to interrupt you. For four levels, here you need one hash, two hash, three hash, four hashes. For the hex area, you need 15 hashes. So four versus 15, you have a 4x improvement in the call data size for using binary. So I think binary tree are, are a good option. Um, I think that's the best we can do. Okay, so what does the tree look like? Um, so it, there's a paper in 1990, uh, Kata Jainan and Mackinnon, uh, they defined the children pattern sequence. So on each uh, node, there's a label. Uh, one one means it has left and right child. One zero means it only has a left child and there's no right child. I interpreted that as no right child as being being a hash. So there's a whole you know subtree. Each one of these hashes is just a whole big subtree down to you know uh, depth 22 or 30 or whatever. Um, so that's we don't need that in the witness. This is what the witness looks like. And uh, so the zero one means that there's uh, uh, a hash, no empty left child, so there's a hash, and there is a, a right child. So zero on one, on, you know, the first thing is a zero if it's a hash, uh, or one if it's not a hash. The, the right part is a one if it's, if it's not a hash, a zero if it's hash. So this one has two, a left and right child, so it's one one. So it sort of makes sense. The one means that there's something there, and the zero means that there's a hash there. Um, so that's the that's the the node labels are the tree structure that encodes it, and that's so small. It's like it's less than one percent. Um, uh, then we we don't need these edge labels because they're already given to us, and this is sort of building down to this address, which is the address of here of this account at the leaf, the the, the account leaf is zero zero one zero zero dot 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 one, and then we have an uh, uh, edge label here with the rest of the address, and there's an ellipses that didn't render. Here, so we have to pass call data with node labels, which is so tiny, edge labels, which is still small, account data, which can be arbitrary. You can have uh, balance, nonce, whatever, crypto kitty you own, whatever, um, and then hashes. And these hashes are H1, H2, uh, all of all these hashes. These dominate. These are like 80 percent. And then if you do happen to have signatures or you know, for, for transactions, then that's kind of big too. Uh, the account data, you know, you might need balances and nonces. Well, the, tree, the, the good news is the tree structure, we can get less than 1%. Um, and and there's, there's interactions between these. Um, another thing is the deduplication. So the binary is the big thing. The deduplication, I found that 20% uh, we savings. So we don't have to, you know, certain hashes, uh, if we just had one account, we would have to pass all the hashes down. But we can recompute hashes, so, so we can compute this hash or and this hash so we don't have to sort of, we, we save with deduplication, uh, we save about 20% for significant sizes. That's, that's what I found with my, with my benchmarks. So this is a big improvement. The binary is a big improvement. Uh, so uh, the runtime, it will speak about now. Uh, same thing, uh, 4 million accounts, 40 accounts in witness, uh, 20 milliseconds to, to do it, but it's mostly hashing. And we can improve hashing as well, so I think we can improve this runtime. So we're going to be dominated. This is just for the Merkleization, not to speak of signature verification, and, and uh, that's the other bottom line. We're going to improve that too. So I guess the goal might be 100 milliseconds for, for F2. So the DAP developers uh, have hope uh, here uh, that, that this sort of tr tree stuff is going to be tr uh, marginal, trivial, almost like 1%, 1%. We're approaching zero. That's the important thing. This, uh, we're dominated by things that can be improved, so work is being done to improve the hashing speed, group, uh, the, the uh, transaction, you know, re either, either the EC recover, you know, the Saki curve, or uh, add 25519 is another option which has some more advantage of any oh. battery. It's on a different screen, though, isn't it? Okay, I can, I can just power through. Um, so, 
uh, what was written here is that I, I do the pre, I merge the pre root and post root uh, together. So in one pass, so I sort of merge the, the traversal, and it's and it's made like that. You saw because the call data is passed like that in uh, uh, depth first pre order because that's how we traverse the tree. So the, the the way you pass the reason it's so fast at runtime, there are interactions with call, call data and runtime, but they're both sort of if we sort of reach some sort of optimal point where you know. Uh, we, it's perfect for both. This is a great configuration for both. Uh, that uh, uh, we can traverse. You know, uh, it's like app codes. It's like the op, it's similar to the app code model, but I, I call them node labels and not app codes. And then the traversal is just a recursive call here. And then later on, once we return the hash to here, we do a recursive call here. Or if this was a hash, we would just grab the hash. And we know what to do here because we have the one one. Uh, so we know to recursive, recurse left and right, but if it was a one zero, we would recurse left, and then when that returns, we just grab the hash and we hash up. Uh, there's a bunch of other options. I'm using C, so I'm just using pointers. I'm creating a stack uh, as I traverse, so I'm putting the, the, the hash that I return here exactly where I'm going to hash here, and then the hash I return here exactly where I need it to hash here, so there's minimized mem copies. All these little things, these microcontroller people, these embedded system people know these stuff, these sort of tricks where you sort of uh, minimize mem copy. All these things are important now uh, with F2 because speed. We're desperate for you know runtime and we're desperate for call data. So everything has to be perfect uh, for the DAP developers. Um, so I already mentioned call data in traversal order, Merkleized pre root in the same avoid mem copy. So I, I mentioned that stack. There are a few other things. I'm not. I'm just giving you a, a high level overview. There are details that will. This is like the easy part, but uh, there are some details that I spent a lot of time on. Um, so I already have, it says next here, adaptive hash length. So why 256 bit? Is, is that a requirement for everybody? Nobody's broken 100, a lot of 106. I don't think any significant, you know, good 160 bit hash has been broken. And let's say it is broken. Let's say Blake 2 b 160 bit hash is broken. What if we have adapted, adaptive hashes where we re with, you know, 176 bit? Uh, you know, if you submit a proof of collision, then we can, you know, re on chain. Uh, and then we can go for another 10 years. Um, so that'll improve things a lot by 30, you know, 32 bytes versus 20 bytes. That's like a, what, like, you know, 33% improvement in the call data. So all these things, you know, this 30%, this 20%, all this stuff adds up. Another one is caching. For us, there's a proposal to uh, store it. Alexei taught us, he had some blog posts that if you hash the recent, uh, you cache, uh, so you, you maintain the recent hashes that were used. Uh, then you can sort of uh, reuse those and, you know, it'll save as well, so it'll, it'll increase, you know, there'll be a worst case scenario, but if the, if the hashes are, if the cache has a lot of hashes and they're reused a lot, then uh, uh, we'll have, you know, this will change, there'll be a lot, lot more signatures, meaning transactions, and what else did I want to say? The insert and delete is written, it's ready, the test generation isn't ready yet. So how does insert and in, in, uh, remove happen? Well, we, we, we find the neighbors, we find this, let's say I want to insert a neighbor to this one, which, whose address is 00100 dot 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 one, one zero one one zero dot 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 one zero, that's this. Uh, this sort of cuts off. Uh, let me scroll it so it's the full thing, or, yeah, that's the full thing. Um, so we, we instantiate a tree uh, as, you know, pointers to the children, but we know, we passed this call data, this is all done already, I just need test case generation, uh, that uh, we instantiate a node here, uh, then we have left pointer to the hash, right pointer to this, and then we insert by, you know, taking the, the right pointer, so we have, you know, this, this tree structure, we have pointers to the left and right child, uh, we, we do some uh, a bit twiddling to, to ch change the node label or whatever, uh, 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 and uh, uh, we insert the node, so it's, and then when we Merkleize, we do, we sort of Merkleize this subtree that's actually instantiated where we, you know, instantiate children, pointers to children. But that's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be, almost like, uh, uh, you can insert a few nodes, or like eight, eight, I think for Ethereum it's on average, they've inserted uh, per block eight accounts on average, but maybe sometimes more, sometimes less. So I think it's going to be trivial, uh, just, just because we're doing a little bit of, you know, Update parent, update left child, update you know insert new internal node things like this, uh, but it's it's just going to be you know very close. Uh, to, it's just going to be like a few things. We call this sort of business logic, this sort of fast stuff. The, it's still going to be dominated by hashing, I believe, and then the speed up hashing bottleneck, and then speed up transaction. So I think there's hope. That's the, what I want to say. That there's hope for this model. The other big thing, a huge thing, is this 25 kilobytes. They're gonna they're talking about way more. This new proposal I saw. 
uh, uh, for 64 shards, they're talking about increasing call data by a lot. Um, they're like, you know, 128 or even, uh, there's some 512? 512. 512, you know, half a, mag half a megabyte. So this is huge. And then this, this sort of deduplication is going to be way, is going to help us a lot. It's not going to be only 20% because there's going to be so many more accounts. So this is uh, going to help. So, you know, every cycle is important. Every you know, byte of call data is important. That's what I, and then, you know, C program is high. I'm writing EWAS and contracts in C. So that's it. <laughs> time for questions or introduce the next yeah. questions. Yes, sir. Uh, I was a little confused with what you're deduplicating exactly. Yes. Um, so if you have one, uh, Child, uh, you can you have to pass all the witness, all the hashes, all the you know neighbors, neighbor, 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 all the way down. But uh, you don't have to do that because you recompute sometimes. Uh, you can you can recompute the, them, so you don't have to pass. It, it'll be recomputed on chain anyway, so you have because you have to recompute it up this this side anyway. So then you don't pass certain hashes at the very very close to the root. You you don't pass hashes because they're going to be computed anyway. You mean essentially constructing a multi-proof or? Yes, it's, yes. Oh. I should have just used the word multi-proof. Okay. But maybe some people don't like that word. Um, and another question, since you're calling it uh, call data size, you're imagining that these come equipped with every transaction and then when they get bunched together in a block, you do this deduplication or multi-proof construction of them and then uh, yep. you get the final proof. Great question. Who does this, you know, merging of these multi-proofs in, uh, into one? Yes, it could be done. Uh, we need a hero, uh, that writer who will write this merging and this best practices. Maybe not. Maybe it'll be similar to this. Maybe it won't be similar. But I don't know how much better you're going to get with me if we're dominated by hashes and dominated by hashes. But hopefully there will be some hero that invents uh, an EE with all this, you know, merging and the perfect tree and the perfect everything. So yes, I don't know. But I mean, an alternative is that you let the block prove produce this multi-proof. Yeah. yeah, so uh, they'll have a, uh, by, by that I mean, they'll, there will be some block producer, some relayer infrastructure, whatever, some fee market infrastructure to handle all of this stuff. I, it, it's a big question, but it's unopinionated. The, the great thing about F2 is that, you know, crypto kitties or whoever can, can launch and some, there will be some hero that will invent the new relayer or the new, and it's not going to be, you know, you have to do it this way because Ethereum Foundation said so. It's going to be, you know, you know, do it however you want, and please teach us because I think that DAP developers are much better at doing things than us, maybe. There was another question. Can we do it? Uh, actually, I, I probably lost some context of call. what's the definition of call data. It's basically the data that use to some proof, to consist of proof that uh, demonstrate uh, like, like a model proof of one account. Is that what the purpose of this? Yes, the call data is an F1 I, right now, uh, which you sign some string of bytes that you pass and then... Uh, it's to the validator valid data to verify the post and create state that's starting from this uh, Yes, so currently the call data doesn't need this proof. The call data is just I want to send it, I want to send them my transaction to this, or my, I want to send my crypto kitty to this person. Uh, but with, uh, with F2, with statelessness, uh, they have to also in their call data pass this whole tree structure, these edge labels, these accounts, these hashes. So the, the call data is going to be much, much huger. And so in the alternate F environment, what about the number? The data, like for example, code by code, or something else, that's also required in code data. Yes. The of smart contracts, for example. Yes, but the, the EEs will already have the smart contracts will already exist on chain. But let's say you want to have some extra byte code for some custom thing to send your crypto kitty that it'll, you know, you'll have an interpreter on chain or something. Then yes, you can pass whatever you want. It's, you do whatever you want with call data. You just pass and then invent something amazing, like some crypto kitty 2.0 or something. And then everyone will get, there will be another bubble and everyone will get rich and I'll retire. Do we have time for another one? Uh, we also will have more time after the, the last talks. If it's specific to this talk, maybe do it now. Alright, maybe we'll have another like 10 minutes at the very end. Okay. Will, will speak now. It's Jerry. Oh, Jared will speak. <laughs> um, okay. 
you have the link for mine, Will? Yeah, it's two hours last week. Here's your link. That's, uh, that's I've been okay. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Jared Wassinger. Um, I'll just preface this that I am not an expert on zero knowledge proofs or rollups. So if I say anything that is extremely inaccurate, don't feel free or er, feel free to correct me. <laughs> but that being said, is there, yes, there's a clicker. Oh, cool. So, um, what is Rollup? Um, it leverages uh, zk snark proofs to batch transactions off-chain and provide succinct proofs on-chain. Um, like many quote-unquote L2 solutions, uh, there are operators and verifiers. Operators take transactions off-chain um, and batch them into proofs which are then submitted on-chain and verified. Um, so, Zero knowledge proofs um, are constant sized, uh, verified in constant time, uh, assuming the yes, verified in constant time for a given circuit. Uh, and for rollup, this means that proofs can be verified regardless of the number of transactions that are batched. Um, uh, right, and so scalability um, is mainly constrained by the uh, on the proving side. Um, and yeah, so I think we've had a, a few existing uh, roll-up systems that have been advertised uh, to provide like somewhat in the order of one to two magnitudes of uh, transaction throughput uh, on the EVM today. Um, right. Um, so why is roll-up an interesting application for E2? Uh, well. Um, the data availability requirements are um, somewhat lower than, say, the other on-chain, um, like if we're talking about verifying multi-proofs on-chain. Well, this is a, this is similar to, to, to what is happening with Rollup, but the data availability requirements are going to be lower um, with Rollup proofs. Um, there are no exit games, lockup periods, um, basically, your funds can only be spent if you, if an operator can only spend your funds if they have your private keys. Um, so we've been using uh, WebSnark, which uh, I think, Jordy, this is your tool, thank you. Um, uh, so handwritten in Wasm, um, and we've been able to, well, generate, Wasm generated from handwritten text format, but, um, right. So if we look up, look at um, some benchmarks, uh, we can actually see that um, if you look on the left, uh, Rust Native, and this is for a two-point pairing check, um, Rust Native is actually very comparable to an interpreter, uh, assuming that we shim in the big, num big number operations as uh, natively uh, as host functions. Um, and Oh, okay, thanks. So I'll just go from left to right. Um, Rust native, 4.2 milliseconds. Wabbit, um, 5.7 milliseconds. V8 turbofan, 7.5 milliseconds. V8 lift up, and these are uh, uh, compilers here. Uh, V8 is, uh, is gonna be 12 milliseconds. Uh, and then if we look at the interpreters, Wabbit uh, shoots up to 236 milliseconds, and V8 is at 733. Um, right, so I mean, kind of the point of this talk, and I don't have the numbers currently, because um, we weren't able to generate the charts in time, but uh, I can, I'll just have, have you take my word that Rust compiled to Wasm in general is a lot slower than these uh, optimized uh, handwritten uh, WASM binaries. Um, and so it kind of illustrates a point that um, perhaps E development is going to be specialized in the sense that DAP developers, the, the set of tool sets for that, the, the set of skill sets for DAP developers versus E developers is going to be akin to uh, 
protocol developers versus non-protocol developers, and it's going to require perhaps a, a, a specialized skill set in both maybe cryptography and uh, understanding WebAssembly uh, to really squeeze as much juice out of these uh, execution environment e execution engines as possible um, to get uh, the performance that we want that we want and need for E2. Um, so yeah, that. Um, that's my talk. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, and I think I'm going to hand it off to Will. Uh, actually, um, Alex just going to, while I'm setting up, talk about uh, some of the sessions tomorrow. And then I'll dive into a quick um, 10 minute demo and explain what we're trying to do by simulating cross shark behaviors already. Um, which we kind of circle back from the intro talk uh, real quick. I just wanted to mention these two sessions tomorrow because you are experts at ease now. Uh, so in the morning at 9.10 in B8, there's this two hours long GM 2.0 phase one and two developer experience. Uh, I think it's going to be a really good session, so if you are interested in ease and, and how it's going to work, you should show up. And there's another one at 12 in B8, so it's on this floor as well. Um, we have a one hour long minimal execution anyway, so basically it's going to be kind of a flexible panel um, about the work which was showcased here. And um, it will also consist of uh, E2.0 client developers and some researchers. So it's going to be a really good place to ask questions and discuss this more in depth. So Will, please go ahead. Uh, cool. Also, uh, yeah, I'll be giving a kind of quick 10 minute overview over EEs in this as well. Um, okay, so let me start. Um, so I think, like, just to summarize everything uh, we've seen and uh, tied into this, um, I mean, what we're seeing from an early perspective is that, you know, we, we can build. Um, these EEs in a stateless way that's performant enough um, for ETH2, and that's that's pretty cool. And so, kind of what we talked about earlier is, as you know, now now that we have begun to validify that, um, we have new things to to validate. And so, um, that would be different models around cross shard transactions. Um, and also different models around the fee market and the relay market. You know, someone has to be responsible for setting up these multi-proofs, um, refreshing the multi-proofs every block as well. And uh, you know, so so we want to be able to make a test grounds um, by which we can, um, you know, we can show all of that. And so that's the goal of the work behind this. Um, so uh, in general. Um, the purpose is we want to be able to simulate the system end to end. We want to begin building simulations around the um, the fee market um, and relay network as well. Um, and we want to have um, you know you can write an EE and you can you know communicate cross shards now. So uh, that's the goal here. Um, and you know the the system you know should also uh, have um, core tenants of. Uh, you know, the shards should be forking, have stability, and that should be configurable. Um, so you can also deal with reorgs and, um, you know, respond accordingly. Um, so in this, validators are simulated using local keys. Um, so it's not like there's an entry into the test net. So it's not like you're gonna run your own um, node that can enter into it. This is, again, more of a, um, a test net that is set up and optimized for you to write around um, that mimics multiple shards and shows a beacon chain that's running and that is interacting with these shard chains. Um, also, what will be really cool and what I'd like to have by January is real-time deployments of EEs. So having having this running and, you know, as a developer, you being able to write an EE and uh, deploy it with a click and then being able to see how, you know, how you can interact with that in, in the simulation as a whole. Um, so what it isn't, so we're not dealing with networking, so we're not trying to benchmark any of the networking side of things. Um, 
you know, it's all simulated, so you, you can't, you know, start it out and connect to this, this network. Um, and we're not trying to build any type of production client. Um, that's not our goal at all. So again, we just are trying to validate all these things and let people have an early, um, early foray into this world. Uh, so, uh, you know, the system should be configurable. You should say how many shards are running. Um, you know, you should set the forkability parameters. Um, you know, one of the things Vitalik, you know, has given uh, three different, you know, proposals over the last, um, uh, over the last couple months. And uh, I think, you know, some of his new proposals are, are really awesome. Like, they all have trade-offs and there's, there's some really cool things. And so, um, if we're able to just test those um, pretty quickly and make changes, that, that, becomes, that becomes really valuable. So that's, that's kind of the goal um, of this and, and what we're building. And we have a basic functioning system right now. Um, and so I'll talk about that and just show you real quick and then talk kind of about the vision behind that. Um, again, it provides endpoints to interact with the block producer. You get the historical data. So these would be like what you would have as normal RPC endpoints. Um, one of the things is this is right now a fork of Lighthouse. Um, and uh, um, so what we did is we used the beacon chain that Lighthouse has, and I wrote um, a shard chain. Uh, and then the shard chain you know, interacts with the beacon chain. Um, and uh, it's right now it's running one shard chain. It's, um, I think after DevCon, I'm going to expand it to be able to run you know, four or five. Um, and it's fairly trivial. I just didn't, you know, want to break a bunch of stuff before coming here, so that that will be uh, working, and that's that's pretty cool. Um, so I'll just kind of show you. I showed this demo briefly in my talk on the first day, um, but uh, in this case, um, what I will first do is just clear the screen here. Um, I'm going to start. Um, the demo. So, so the first thing that we're doing is we're fast forwarding the beacon, uh, beacon chain, uh, and we're bringing it to the phase one fork epic. So the phase one fork epic is basically um, the beacon chain is going to be running uh, alone without the shards. Once you reach the fork, fork epic, then the shards are going to start. So now we see that the shards um, are running, and we're simulating three second shard blocks and six second beacon blocks, and so. In a second, you're going to see that there will be a crosslink, uh, crosslinks that are submitted to the beacon chain. Uh, finality is established, and ultimately, uh, that prunes the fork choice rule uh, for the shard chain as well. Um, on this end, I'm about to start a client called. Uh, well, it's part of what uh, Matt was talking about is uh, she shard ether, um, and this is not only an EE, but it also um, uh, is a binary that lets you. Um, that basically builds the proofs that we were talking about. So this could be considered an early relayer um, or an early state provider. Um, so it keeps its own vision of state locally. And it, uh, yeah, it generates the multi-proofs that are needed for transactions to establish um, transfers and, and balances. So uh, here we go. Okay, so if I just do a basic transfer, this is actually creating a uh, multi, basically a multi-proof of this transaction is going to submit it uh, to the block producer on the shard chain right now. And so, uh, the transfer happened. Um, and so you'll see that a new state group is now um, available for that execution environment. So that operated there. And I'm going to show just a little bit of code in a moment. Um, and we can you know, look at the balance now as well and see that that uh, was updated. So that's really cool. So the, the goal is really now, you know, all, all these EEs that are being built, we can start plugging into this. Um, and uh, we, we want to kind of change this to where it's no longer just a fork of Lighthouse, um, but we want to actually just pull it in to Scout and have this be just an additional tool set in Scout that lets you mimic this whole system and 
um, you know, we don't we don't need the networking side of things. We can you know fairly simplify um, a decent amount. Uh, so. Here you'll see this is the um, code to, so there's a lot of work, lots of cleanup needed, um, lots of things that need to be um, added. Um, but again, the system is working end to end and what's, what's cool is that the, uh, the hardest thing is not writing state transitions and wasn't actually including the, including scour the runtime. The hardest part of all this, well, excuse me, the hardest part of all this was uh, just getting everything from the fork choice rule, the, uh, the, the persistent store, everything like that, to all, all um, function in tandem. And so, um, anyways, this, this should ultimately, after cleanup, be pulled into, um, into Scout or um, initially maybe into the Lighthouse repo. Uh, the actually plugging in uh, Scout and the runtime into the node um, was actually surprisingly simple, um, and that's that's really cool. And so this is really good for um, the client developers. Um, in this case, uh, all we really have is in the state transition for a process shard block body. Um, we can just instantiate a runtime. Right now we're passing the block body. Again, this is an early prototype. Um, this would really just access the uh, beacon state and the shard state. Um, and then you have functions within your EE that can uh, that can interact with those. So this is uh, fairly simple. Again, this uh, will need to be expanded to where you can do interactive deployments of new EEs, um, and some of the logic here also needs to be moved uh, back up to the beacon chain. But this is a um, it's pretty cool. This is an early um, yeah an early uh, system, and uh, pretty excited to. Uh, running ease in a much more realistic environment or real world environment. So, thanks, guys. Uh, anyone have questions? Yeah. So, two questions. So, why is does this auto signaling uh, the open economies like the uh, uh, incentive for the for example, producer and also like for the state providers for this? Gotcha. Yeah. So that's that's something that I'm gonna start doing uh, after DevCon, actually. So I want to start. Uh, so Quilt has grown, and we have a really awesome team and really awesome uh, and engineers. Um, and so I am uh, going to probably start migrating, and myself, I'll start working on building simulations that will plug into this from the state provider network. Um, and the relay network. So I'm going to start doing some early research on that since we really need to validate that. Um, as far as what you were saying, the token economy and paying a block producer. Um, so again, it depends on which proposal we go with. So Vitalik has a new one that kind of enshrines uh, ETH into the shards. Um, if we go in that direction, this makes uh, my work a lot easier. And I'm actually fairly excited about that one. But again, each proposal has pros and trade-offs, so it's ultimately seeing like what do developers, you know, in this ecosystem want, and I, I think we'll probably dive into the meat, into some of the meat of that tomorrow in these sessions as well. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if that, that like answered your question, but in 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 the system where sharp um, ether is more enshrined, um, it, it becomes more of a system of just state providers. How do you pay someone to provide state? Um, if ether is less enshrined. Um, then you need a whole system. It, it becomes a little bit more complex um, because the block producers uh, need to um, basically uh, need to have some level of trust with the relayers, and, and there's some complexity there. Whereas yeah. in, the, in, in this new model that he's proposed, they don't, they don't, and uh, and so um, yeah, I guess it's a higher level overview without spending ten minutes talking about it. Yeah, because like the. The following question is that because this token is incentive have also have changes a lot of behaviors of like stakeholders and corresponding validators. So in, in such case, how like maybe the simulator can help to maybe explain those economic behaviors on these interactions? Yeah, that's the goal. And then have it have it be um, have it 
have some actual But right now it's not well defined, right? It's not well defined yet, yeah. And so I, I think we need um, we need just a, you know a little time first to figure out what proposal we're going to go with, um, and maybe some of the some of the direction of the research that you know I'll, I'll dive into, and then also John Adler is going to be diving into as well. Uh, John, raise your hand. Yeah, um, regarding this, I think you know can also help fuel that direction. Um, yeah. Is anyone interested in relay markets and fee markets and like getting involved in that area? If you are, like, feel free to like put your hand up. And, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Let's let's talk. Yeah. That's sweet. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Um, I guess I'm just being allowed here, but um, is it feasible in a way that, like, say we can open up an area in the memory, say this area is gonna be there? for the sake of this entire block of transactions execution, so that let's say, when you do like stateless things, um, like maybe there are uh, multiple transactions uh, touching stuff in the same EE, and then they all try to construct a tree, but then the previous transaction has already constructed a part of the tree, and then the, set, the following one has constructed another part of the tree, and also because, uh, you know, and there's also out, out of date in the same tree, right? Then, like, then conflicting transactions in the same block can go together because, you know, the following one sees, oh, it's already updated, someone constructed it, I'm just gonna use it instead of reconstruct the proof kind of thing. We, we have partial oh, state, state I guess. Uh, What's that? I've used, like, some ideal partial state or casual state. Yeah, and no, so like this way. Yeah, did you say? We have a caching API under consideration, and I think you guys did some tests with it. We have a caching API, uh, and I think we we had some tests with it, but it's not conclusive yet. Right. Any other questions? No more questions? All right. I think so.